Hi, everyone. This is Dorothea Hendricks, your communication coach and presentation skills and public speaking. Our guest today is a native of Ireland, Roger Killen. Roger Killen graduated from Trin Trinity College. I can't even say that. Trinity College in, in Dublin in 1973. He is, he was a serial entrepreneur. He is a serial entrepreneur. He will be a serial entrepreneur probably until his last breath. And he's built 12 diverse businesses over his 44-year career. He has, since 2013, produced nine incredibly successful TEDx events, probably uh, some of the most successful TEDx events in Western Canada and going down Canada's coast and the coast of U.S. of A. He's also coached over 100 TEDx speakers. Roger is a well-traveled explorer and amateur historian, and he's currently deepening his connection to this planet through something called transformative travel. He also sees himself as a biohacker who supports seniors' efforts in leading a more vital and valued retirement. So let's welcome Roger. Roger, so nice to see you again. So nice to see you as always, Dorothea. Oh, the man is full of compliments. Anyway, Roger, I, here you are. Uh, you you are an entrepreneur. I think you can't help yourself. You see something, you want to, you know, dig in your heels and build something from scratch. But now you're in retirement and you are speaking on cruise ships. Uh, how did that happen? How did that come about being a cruise ship speaker? Oh, well, for many years, I was a what's called a gentleman host on cruise ships. What that means is that my job as a volunteer was to dance with single ladies. There was always more than one of me, several gentleman hosts on each cruise ship. <clears throat> and we would always look at the cruise ship speakers with envy. Green, a green aura would form around us as we looked at the cruise ship speakers because they had it so good. We had to share a cabin. Uh, we would uh, uh, work hard, i.e. dance with single ladies, many of whom were like dancing with a refrigerator. Uh, uh, and we had to have on our jacket, our shirt, our tie, and the perspiration was running. And we had rashes on our, on our, uh, uh, from the chaffing. And the speakers just looked so cool and had such a good time that whenever my turn came to stop being a dancer and I had the time to be a speaker, uh, I uh, just jumped uh, headlong into that role. Uh, initially, I retained an agent to place me aboard uh, certain ships. And uh, now I have a relationship with uh, one major cruise line, a very high-end cruise line, and I devote my time and talent to delivering talks aboard uh, that cruise line's uh, ships. And that's how that all happened. Wow. So this has been something in the making because you uh, being a, you know, helping being an escort or dancer or, or uh, you know, with ladies on, on ships. That was a number of years ago. So this this kernel, this seed of being a speaker actually was inside of you for many, many years before it actually blossomed, came out. And here you are now heading out. Uh, in fact, you are leaving tomorrow to go on a speak on a cruise ship. What's the process here? How does it how do you get onto the ship? Can you just maybe tell us what will be happening tomorrow? Uh, okay. Uh, so I leave uh, Vancouver Airport, YVR, fly to Seattle, pick up uh, an Icelandic uh, air flight uh, to Reykjavik, uh, board the Viking uh, Saturn, and uh, then overnight in Reykjavik, and then off we go across the North Atlantic. Uh, I uh, do my first talk. Uh, on the evening before we come to Dublin, my first talk is called uh, Dublin's Top 10 Storytellers, starting with uh, Jonathan Swift, uh, mm. century and working forward. Then uh, as we cross the Irish Sea to Liverpool, I do my second talk. That's about um, downtown Liverpool and the Scousers who live there. Then we head south on the Irish Sea, cross the English Channel, at which point I do my third talk, uh, an introduction to Iberia. 
Uh, then uh, we go to uh, Akaruna, Akarunya. I'm trying to learn how to how to speak these names as the locals do, Akarunya. Uh, then leave Akarunya and head towards Portugal, where I do my third my my next talk, which is uh, Portugal's four heroes. Uh, then uh, down the length of Portugal. Th uh, through Gibraltar into the Mediterranean, where I do my next talk, and that is um, Spain's 15th century dashing hero, Christopher Columbus. Talk about Christopher Columbus. Then we leave uh, Valencia. I hope I'm impressing you with my dialect. Valencia. <laughs> we leave Valencia, and I do my my sixth and final talk, which is about the North Atlantic, the, the rise and fall of the North Atlantic liner trade, then arrive in Barcelona and fly back uh, Air Canada, Barcelona, direct to Vancouver. So how long is that entire cruise? So the time you leave, you, you <coughs> land on the ship and get at your destination. How long is that? Uh, that is uh, 15 nights. Uh, uh, yeah. 15 nights. Yeah, that's amazing. So there's a, a lot of research that goes into that. So what you're talking about are the destinations where people actually will get off, where the ship will dock and the, and people will get off and explore. Is that correct? Uh, some of the talks are destination. For example, the Iberia talk, Introduction to Iberia, the Liverpool talk. Uh, the other talks are more about something to do with that city, that port of call, Dublin, for example, mm -hmm. Dublin's top, top 10 storytellers. And some are what is called enrichment talks would have really nothing to do with the destination. Uh, they're there to inform uh, the, uh, the passengers about the, about the context, about some aspect, for example, uh, uh, Spain's dashing 15th century hero, Christopher Columbus, is not about any particular uh, port of call, but it is about uh, Christopher Columbus and what the, the, the life and times of Christopher Columbus, what the world looked like in the, uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries, and specifically what Spain and Portugal looked like uh, in those times. And the passengers love that background mm -hmm. uh, information. Yeah, so the question here is, do they give you this? Do they tell you what you're going to be talking about? Do they give you the content and you kind of massage it into your own way, your own your own presentation? Or do you have to do all this research? Is this a lot of legwork for you to put this content together and then deliver it? So here's how that process works. Uh, I I get out of bed one morning and I decide, oh, I'd like to do something in pick a month, October, may as well pick this month, September. Uh, and I, I do that perhaps in May. Uh, okay, uh, I want to do go on a cruise in September. So then I go to a website and that website is a two-sided marketplace where the cruise ships, cruise lines post their vacancies and speakers, uh, 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 with an annual subscription, use that website in order to see what the vacancies are. So I go there and I, I go straight to the Viking cruise line. All the cruise lines are there, but Viking is my favorite. favorite. Uh, and then I look at their seven ships and I look at where the ships, where the available speaking slots are on the seven ships. And because I am footloose, fancy free as a single guy, I can really go anywhere that tickles my fancy. So I find a ship that has a vacancy in October to, in this case, happened in May, uh, 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 from uh, Iceland to Barcelona, taking in Portugal, Spain, a little bit of Ireland, a little bit, little bit of England. Sounds great to me. Let's do this. Then I look at the requirements uh, that are posted on the website as to what you need to do, be, say, on this cruise. Then I take a couple of days doing some research and put together six talks uh, that work for the itinerary of this cruise line. I then post, I then design a, a title, 
and a one sentence synopsis of each of my proposed talks. I then post that on the website. Uh, the contact at Viking, the lady who looks after the speakers, selects the speakers and, and talks, takes a look at my proposal and comes back to me and says, well, I really like the first five, but the sixth talk, uh, could you tweak it a little bit? I then say, yep, tweak it a little bit. And so we end up with a uh, an agreed upon itinerary of talks. Uh, uh, and now my investment thus far has been a day or two in doing research to arrive at those titles and, and sentences. Then uh, two, two months in advance of the departure day of the talk, uh, uh, a Viking wants to see my completed uh, slideshows. Uh, so it takes roughly for every minute of talk, it takes about an hour of research. So 45 minute talk, 45 hours of research, then committing that research into a PowerPoint presentation, animating the PowerPoint presentation, practicing the PowerPoint presentation. So now I'm ready to go. I send my PowerPoint to Viking who give me feedback and uh, they want to change this and this and this and this. So now we end up with again, an agreed upon uh, format. Uh, we've got the talks, we've got the titles, we've got the synopsis, we've got the PowerPoints, uh, and those are what I am committed to deliver at a high level of excellence, uh, starting in this case, Wednesday, two days from now of this week. Okay, wow. There is a fair amount of legwork that's involved, and from the sounds of it, you are actually, you're, you, you have to submit and know that there are other speakers also who want to speak, and so it's it's a bit of a competition, isn't it? Uh, not really. Uh, wh whenever, whenever you see a green check mark against a particular cruise, you know that that slot is available. Yes. You're not competing with anybody. Uh, 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 you're really competing with yourself. Uh, uh, you have to do the work in order to submit an acceptable roster of talks. Right. Once they're accepted. Uh, then uh, Viking is trusting me to to deliver a high level talk to people who are paying some very serious money uh, for that cruise. So my standard has to be extremely high in order to to not let Viking down, uh, which I would never want to do. Uh, uh, so so you just rise to the occasion, whatever it takes. And, and and of course you want to go on and do this again on another Viking cruise. Yes. Yeah. Well. yeah. It's so, all about building a trusted relationship, yes, yeah. the Viking with the speaker and the speaker with Viking. Yeah. So for anybody who would like to hear more, because this interview is going to continue for another 25 minutes or so with Roger about his being a cruise ship speaker, what it takes and how he does it and any particulars. So by all means, please go to my YouTube channel, Dorothea Hendricks, D-O-R-O-T-H-E-A, Hendricks, H-E-N-D-R-I-K-S. And looking forward to seeing you there. And now, Roger, let's let's continue with this interview. One of the questions that I that I have for you is you are speaking for free on this. Why? Well, I'm 72 years old, Dorothea, and um, being a biohacker, I believe I can live to be 120 in good health. So I say to myself, what am I going to do for the next uh, 20, 30 years? And a life filled with luxury cruising sounds to me like a pretty good life. Uh, so I'm more than happy to trade my public speaking skills, my research skills, uh, my uh, my love of serving people. Uh, I'm happy to trade those for the right to go on uh, high end uh, cruise lines as uh, as a volunteer. But I get my cruise, I get my flights, I can bring a travel companion, uh, I get um, to go on the shore excursions. Uh, often multiple shore excursions at no cost, uh, so long as I agree to be a ship's ambassador aboard the coach or aboard the walking tour, whatever it might happen to be. It strikes me as a win-win uh, outcome. 
Yes. Yeah. Because I think often people think, oh, and maybe there was a time many decades ago where people did get paid, but that whole dynamic has changed. And certainly, as you say, in terms of your retirement, living in a, a life that is filled with excitement and uh, exploring because you see yourself in a way as an explorer. And that's exactly what you're doing. You also mentioned in your introduction, you know, I, I, that you are doing transformative travel. And when I was going on with the different websites, looking at what types of travel, there's experiential travel, uh, transformative travel, uh, immersion travel, which I think is also called uh, experiential travel. So many different kinds of travel. What is transformative travel? Transformative travel is a form of travel where something gets transformed. Uh, now, in this case, I know I get transformed because those 45 hours of research per talk, I am learning so much. Yeah. I am real. I, I'm, I'm from Ireland. I knew nothing about uh, Jonathan Swift or Bram Stoker or Oscar Wilde or uh, any of those uh, uh, incredible storytellers. And now I know an awful lot more, not exhaustive, but an awful lot more than I used to. Same too with Liverpool, same too with Portugal and Spain, same too with Christopher Columbus. Uh, I, I have a love of lifelong learning, so I get transformed. But my principal job is to transform the experience of the passengers. Those two to 300 people who sit there in the audience on a Viking cruise, I want, I want to bring to life the the statues the stories the images they see about these characters because if i can do that i can really change their experience of those ports of call and the hinterlands uh, behind them and that's what transformative travel is in this case the audience gets transformed i get transformed and hopefully we have a very positive impact on the port of call that we are visiting and which is the subject of my talk. Right. It's, and I, listening to you, I already feel like I'm in the process of being transformed, getting excited. And I can honestly say, you know, the idea of being on a cruise ship has never been one of my goals in life has never really, oh, don't get that excited. But listening to you, I am getting excited. I'm thinking, oh, how cool is this, right? That, uh, and it is, it's a learning and it's a benefit uh, working both sides. You spent a number of years, I think, uh, you know, you put together nine TEDx events on, and, and one per year, and that is a huge undertaking. Working with TEDx speakers and putting on those events, has that somehow, is there something there that has, you think, that's put you in a position of being a better speaker uh, aboard the cruise line, aboard Viking, than if you hadn't done that? Is there something that you trans have transferred over from producing those TEDx events to now speaking on cruise ship? Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, training speakers to, de to deliver a TEDx talk. Uh, when you, I, I decided very early on in my coaching career that I wanted each speaker to inspire the audience to take action around their novel idea. And uh, I now have that exact same attitude with my uh, cruise ship talks. I want the audience to do something. I want them to have impact on that port of call. And so the whole talk is leading to this crescendo, this call to action, uh, so that I can bring about that impact uh, uh, that I want to bring. And it's a formula. It's a step-by-step -step, uh, formula, starting with, at the very opening, why am I here? Why am I talking to you 200 people? Because I want you to have a more memorable experience of this port of call, and I want you to leave behind something causing the locals to feel good about you, to feel feel they've met some new, fresh, exciting people. Uh, 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 and, and then as I go through, I remind people several times what the purpose of my talk is. And then at the end, there's the call to action uh, that 
hopefully will, re will result in the impact that I want to create from my talk. In speaking with people, because this isn't your first cruise, you've taken uh, other cruises, what are some questions that have come up from the audience or do they ask questions? Are people, I mean, you're hoping they're engaged, you want them to be engaged, and that sometimes means that they'll ask questions to find out more. Uh, what are some of the questions that people want to know when you're speaking? Uh, on Viking, uh, there is a 45-minute talk limit, and it's tightly enforced. There is no, uh, the speaker does not take questions from the audience during that 45 minutes, mm -hmm. but is very available on that uh, ship in the Explorer's Lounge. Right after their talk, the speaker goes straight to the Explorer's Lounge and is available for Q&A. Uh, interactivity is essential, but it's one way. It's me asking the audience something. Uh, what are the what are the four names that Ireland was called in the 20th century? Okay. Is is the seed I plant at the beginning of my talk, and uh, I come back and give them the answers at the end. So interactivity, but no questions from the audience of me. Ah, that's interesting. All right. Because often what we do is we want to engage. And so the, the formula is slightly different here. If 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 somebody asks you, they said, hey, Roger, I'm thinking of being uh, want to speak on a on a cruise ship. And I, I think I'm going to send in my application. What are the three tips that you might have more? But what are some tips that you could give to someone who wants to speak on a cruise ship? Speaking tips. Mm. Well, they have to have the right profile and they have to be out. It, speaking on a cruise ship is not just speaking. You are a, you are the ambassador for the ship. You're a social creature. When you go for breakfast, lunch or dinner, you must be willing to uh, sit with uh, lonely singles. Uh, you must be willing to sit with shared tables and you are kind of playing host. Uh, on behalf of the ship to get people to talk to each other, to engage in conversation. Uh, that is part of your role. You're, you have to be outgoing. Uh, you have to be well-spoken. You have to have some social graces. Uh, uh, so this is not really where I'm going to be going. If I were speaking, I can go deliver my presentation and then go to the Explorer Lounge, be there for 15 minutes, and then go into the bar and uh, be by myself, isolate myself in a corner or do whatever. Okay. Uh, what, what you're saying here is that I'm always on. If I decide to be a cruise ship speaker, I am always on whether I'm speaking or not, just even as I'm wandering maybe to the hot tub or whatever it might be, I'm on. Yes, you, uh, you have to be available uh, to the passengers. So do you have you found so far that it's been an exciting experience for you? Because I remember you telling me that when you were a host, uh, which was, of course, many, many years ago, that uh, you did end up sometimes having people who wanted to attach themselves to you. And uh, has that happened to you this time? You mean romantically attached themselves? Yes, I mean, yes. Let's let's get personal here, Roger. Well, well, that was that was part of the gentleman host e experience. Yes, uh, it has not been part of the speaker uh, experience. Uh, 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 well, the dynamic, yes, is different. I guess as a speaker, yeah. you are in a totally different position, and you have uh, the whole framework is different than actually being a dance host. Uh, right. Right. Uh, I, I find myself more more uh, reaching out to singles, men and women, uh, and try and uh, sort of include them in the cruise experience. Uh, they might be sitting in the lounge by themselves with a book, and uh, and and to me, they're on. They've just paid some seriously big money to go on this cruise. They can read a book anytime. Uh, but they can't engage socially with the people on the cruise. So I kind of butt in uh, as opposed to being butted into. Yes. Uh, uh, it's just, it's the part, part of the role that you have to play.
Yes, yes. Uh, it's interesting. I like the word ambassador, you know, that you've used uh, a few times. What do you see, Roger? Because you have been, well, with the TEDx events and even your own businesses that you started many years ago and uh, and were successful, you've always had this element of being able to put yourself out there and public speak. So what do you see as your strongest skills when it comes to speaking in giving presentations and connecting with people now that they're they're on a they're on a ship and you don't want them to walk out of the room and you want them to stay in this room and be attentive because you want them to have a good experience and also if they have a good experience you'll have a good experience what do you feel are the strongest skills or the attributes that you have that help you do this and be a good presenter mm -hmm. It, well, it all starts with empathy, uh, moves on to listening, mm -hmm. and then segues into impact. Uh, uh, so every engagement I have, uh, I truly have a desire to make a contribution to the person that I'm with, with whom I am engaging. Uh, and uh, so I ask some open-ended uh, questions and really do listen. I'm not waiting for my turn to come so I can respond. Uh, uh, people who have all the answers are make painful companions, uh, but people who listen, uh, uh, completely different experience. And uh, and and the, my middle name is Roger Impact Killen. I, I want to have a positive impact uh, every day in much of what I do. Uh, I don't have uh, children. I don't have grandchildren. I don't even have pets or plants. So what I want to do is make a positive impact on the, on, on the people that uh, come into my life. Mm -hmm. On a ship, this is a this is a a, a thousand strangers. Uh, I want to impact them in a very positive way, as an audience of two to three hundred, and as a one-on-one -on -one conversation that I'm having sitting beside somebody on a coach, mm -hmm. going on a uh, on a land excursion of some sort. Yeah. And that impact that makes such a big difference. And and, and I think the if I uh, preface that with positive impact. So in terms of speaking, one of the things you've probably seen and listened to speakers who are not making a positive impact, and one of the things I know you mentioned earlier is that you create slides, you build slides and you speak. Do you look at your slides at all when you're speaking? Do you Where do you put your attention when you're giving a presentation? Because a lot of people do look at their material. They read well, it off, yeah. Well, when you mean look, what does that mean? Does that mean read word for word? A lot of people, unfortunately, when you we've uh, looked at when I've looked at present people giving presentations, they do. It's like that that PowerPoint is their security blanket, and they have to keep looking at it, reading it, even when it comes to the welcome sign, welcome everybody, and they're not looking at the audience. Well, but I my my, uh, my typical slide has got an image, and the, then it has got some text in in thirty two uh, uh, font uh, size. And I need to become so familiar with the text that all I have to do is glance. Uh, for example, one line might say, uh, graduated Trinity College, Dublin, 1892. And, and now I've got ammunition to talk about Trinity College, Dublin for Protestants formed by Elizabeth I. Uh, uh, now used to have an enrollment of 200, now has an enrollment of 20,000. It, it triggers, mm -hmm. my text triggers a stream of consciousness that, uh, yes, I need to look at it. And as I get older, more and more do I need to look at that sequence. But that sequence has been designed to give me the clue as to what to talk about. I will never read the slides, but I will always use them as the starting point of a, of a sentence or even a paragraph of words. 
Because mm. if you're reading, you're actually not connecting with your audience. And if you're not connecting with your audience, they're not going to get the experience and you won't have the impact that you really want. So it, uh, it, all, it all just kind of mushrooms and, and you know, impacts one thing, impacts the other. Uh, in terms of your own businesses that you've had and your life as an entrepreneur going back and even maybe thinking about being speaking on a cruise ship right now, who... Who has had the most impact on your life? And what was that impact to make you the person you are today? Or what? Maybe not necessarily a person, but maybe an experience of sorts. I think I have been successful at impacting the uh, lives and knowledge of entrepreneurs. And I think I've done something similar with uh, speakers uh, uh, those hundred ish people I coached on, uh, for TEDx, uh, talks, I think I've positively impacted their lives. Yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. So you've impacted, has anyone impacted you or has, have you had an experience that has impacted you to take a certain direction or certain route in your life that you wouldn't have taken before? Every day. Every day, there's something that happens that that uh, propels you forward that might maybe might make you change your mind from going in this direction over to that direction. I, I, I try to live a hyper aware life. Yes. Uh, so that I I am um, I don't react. Uh, I respond. Uh, uh, and and uh, uh, being living that kind of life. Uh, I hopefully um, have learned enough to avoid some of the incredible faux pas that I created as a younger man. Uh, I've learned my lessons. I'm aware of the lessons. I try not to repeat them. Sometimes I don't do so well, but most of the time I do okay. You, you know, uh, do you want to share a faux pas with us? No. Oh, all right. <laughs> just thought I just some, thought, just some thought. of them are are chronically embarrassing, Dorothy. I say to myself, "What was I thinking?" Yeah, because I was going to, I you know, ask if if uh, knowing what you know now, what is one thing that you would do differently? Just one thing, without you know, getting into any detail that you would that you do differently now, or would do if you had to do it again. I would love my father as he deserved to have been loved. I think that is something that is uh, many of us probably could look back when we think of our parents, our mother or father, and maybe think of treating them differently. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roger, for sharing that. In, in terms of what you're doing right now on speaking on a cruise ship, where did you develop You've been speaking for a long time, but what actually started you to develop your speaking, your presentation skills, and where did you do it? How did that come about? Uh, what, one of my entrepreneurial talents was raising money. And I was invited to give a talk in Victoria, BC. And it was a 60 minute talk that took 90 minutes. And this is a real no-no. So a week later, I joined a Toastmasters club in Vancouver. And that was in the early 90s. And here we are, 30 years later, I'm still an a enthusiastic member of a Toastmasters club, a club that I actually founded in 2006 called the Vancouver Entrepreneurs Toastmasters Club. Uh, designed to help entrepreneurs with their public speaking skills. But by virtue of the fact that all the members are entrepreneurs, they form little strategic alliances. Uh, they, they deliver talks that have entrepreneurial value content. So they learn from each other, uh, as well as de developing public speaking skills. And public speaking skills is one of those soft skills that nobody ever tells an entrepreneur is the game changer for the outcome of their entrepreneurial venture. 
uh, good speaking skills allow them to communicate with uh, with uh, investors, suppliers, employees, customers. Without good public speaking skills, I struggle to see how a business can make it. So going, because one of my questions here was, do you think public speaking skills are important for people? So definitely for entrepreneurs, generally for people, do you think it's a valuable skill to learn? Priceless. Yeah. Priceless. Uh, professional and personal reasons, uh, being able to communicate. Public speaking, I think of it communication, being able to communicate effectively with other human beings, be it in personal life or professional life, is an absolutely fundamental, crucial skill. What is it, what is it that a person needs in order to be an effective public speaker? Well, in order to communicate effectively, because public speaking, you know, people think of Toastmasters as public speaking. That means standing up in front of people. And many people will never stand in front of other people, but they do need to communicate, you know, with staff, with coworkers, with someone. So what do you think here uh, is an essential ingredient in order to be an effective communicator? Uh, the most basic is what's in it for the audience. Right. Uh, all, all communication needs to be audience centric, uh, whether it's one on one, uh, one on 12 or one on 5,000. The, the, the speaker has to ask him or herself the question, what does the audience need to hear? And, and then how can I package my message in such a way that I'm delivering what it is the audience needs to hear in a way in which they can actually hear it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, think, of the, think of the university professor uh, uh, speaking at a high level way above the students. No, that's not effective communication, but dumbing down the message such that it can be heard, understood, and acted upon, that is the most basic to me of all uh, communication skills and is most challenging when it comes in the form of a talk. Mm -hmm. And when that talk is intended to inspire people to take action, that's the most challenging of the most challenging type of talk. And that's what a really good TEDx talk is. And if you find that the audience hasn't responded or hasn't got the message, doesn't pick up the idea, the responsibility really lies with the speaker, right? Coming back. To, yeah, I got to come back to like, what is it that I could have done that I didn't do or shouldn't have done that I did? Right. You know, whatever these uh, questions are. And and in the early days of, of, of crafting speeches, if the speaker doesn't know the structure they really have to retain some kind of a, a mentor or a coach. Uh, to Toastmasters provides a good guideline, do this, then this, and this, and this. Worry about the content first, worry about the delivery second, and ultimately the two merge. Uh, uh, but but um, it's like in anything else in life. If you don't have a mentor or a coach, it just takes much longer uh, and is far more mistake ridden than if you do. Did you have a mentor uh, somewhere along the way for you? With maybe no, 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 but I did follow the Toastmaster model. Okay, all right. On cruise ships, then let's go back to your presentations on cruise ships. Have you done a presentation at one port uh, or one city, and then found oh, I better make some changes before we hit the next one because something maybe hasn't worked the way you thought it would or should work differently? Do you tweak when you're on board? Yeah, um, I've, I just came back from a celebrity cruise to uh, Charleston, then Bermuda. And uh, my talk in Charleston uh, was too heavy on history. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I was giving it, I mean, it's too late to do anything when you're halfway through, uh, uh, it, it, I realized that uh, the celebrity audience, what they are thinking to themselves is, now what attraction should I go to when I'm in Bermuda? Uh, and so uh, what attraction should I go to when I'm in Charleston? And so after that talk to now tweak for Bermuda, 
I took out an awful lot of the history and inserted more of the uh, the attractions, the the day to day things, um, tipping. Passengers always want to know when I'm going to this destination, what is the tipping culture? And so becomes my job to tell them what the tipping uh, culture is. For example, in Europe, the tipping culture is completely different from what it is in North America. And even then there are subsets of tipping. There's uh, restaurants, well, high end is different from fast food, uh, is different from cafes and bars. And so a little, a little one-liner uh, headed restaurants uh, so what do you do in a high-end restaurant? What do you do in a fast food restaurant? What do you do in a in a family style restaurant? What do you do in a bar? What do you do in a cafe? Uh, all that information is available and it's very, very simple. And it's what the audience wants to know. So you made the changes and then your next talk went, uh, you know, of course it, uh, it you got people excited because you were actually speaking with things that they were more interested in, I guess, as opposed. So it's knowing your audience too, which probably changes different ships carry different groups of people. Yes, they do. Um, the, uh, the, the economy ships, the, the big ships, three, four, 5,000 passengers <clears throat> have a very different culture <clears throat> than the high end ships, uh, Viking, Oceana, Silver Sea, Crystal Regent, uh, the audiences are very different from from one group of cruise line to the next, and you and you have to you have to know that audience, and you have to give that audience the information that is relevant. Keyword is relevant to them. So that'd be interesting for anyone who is interested, who's listening right now, thinking, oh, you know, I might, I might take that. I might see if I can be a, a speaker on a cruise ship, depending on where they apply to adjust their what they're saying about themselves and how they they draft their material initially to to get accepted is different from one cruise line to the next. Uh, you're absolutely right, Dorothy. There, there's a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum is entertainment. On the other end of the spectrum is information. Yes. And where you are on that continuum uh, needs is driven by the cruise line. Uh, 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 for example, Viking is more towards information. Uh, celebrity is more towards entertainment. So you have to know that and create your script and your and your delivery style and the nature of your interactivity with that in mind. Do you have um, have you ever at any time, even in you know dry, creating your own businesses or starting the TEDx or here now speaking on the cruise line, have you ever had doubts? Our fears creep in, uh, you know, about, oh, I don't know, maybe your ability or, gee, will you be able to do this or will it work? You know, some kind of doubt. Have you ever had anything like that happen to you, creep in and try to handicap you? I think you're talking about imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, here's the reality. Uh, uh, so uh, my first talk is about Dublin. Second talk, Liverpool. Third talk uh, in the English Channel, Iberian Peninsula. Uh, uh, next talk, Portugal, etc. Well, I was last in Dublin in 1973. Dublin has changed. And here am I talking about Dublin. I actually not talking about Dublin. I'm talking about Dublin's top 10 storytellers. Mm -hmm. Never been to Liverpool. Uh, and and been as a holiday maker to the Costa Brava in Spain, but other than that, never been to Iberia. And that held me back from applying to become a cruise ship speaker for years until one day I realized that 10 minutes of good research, give me 10 minutes of good research and I will know more about a location than 99.9% of the locals. And that aha moment caused me to realize that if you're committed to do high quality and, and, and extensive research, uh, always in always with the mindset that you're serving the, the, the passengers, that you can do this. And you can do this with a very high degree of excellence and you can surpass the ability of the locals 
to deliver uh, relevant content to the audience. If you if you can do that, the imposter syndrome just goes poof. <laughs> oh, thanks so much, Roger. Thank you. It's been very informative and 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 a lot of fun. Uh, if if people do have any questions about this, well, Roger, I guess they can contact you, Roger Killen. Um, where would they get uh, get a hold of you if they wanted more information? Well, I'm kind of old fashioned. Uh, my phone number is uh, 604-408-0888. Okay, old fashioned on the Good. phone. Good. And uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll uh, put it down on on one of our. You'll see it here on the uh, on the recording. I'll put it down. So thank you so much, Roger. Really, uh, you've been listening, everybody. You've been listening to my guest, Roger Killen, who has discovered a new passion and the opportunity to make a difference speaking on cruise ships. Thanks, Roger, for sharing your experience with us, your insights, and giving us some tips for anyone who's interested in wanting to go and be a dynamic and engaging speaker, whether on cruise ships or just speaking about town. Thanks again, Roger. Wishing you, wishing you mountains of success and wishing everybody else out there mountains of success. <laughs>